the hub of emotion regulation is check the facts. Do my emotions and the intensity fit the facts? And is this emotion something that I want to keep feeling? Yes, that's true. Maybe I need to go into problem solving. If it's not serving me or my feelings and intensity don't fit the facts, maybe I want to do opposite action to this. If you've been feeling depressed and you're in bed and you're like, this is not serving me anymore. I'm struggling with depression, but laying in bed is not helping me feel better. That might be the time when you reach for opposite action to depression. You're going to get up. You're going to get dressed. You're going to do all those things that your emotion is telling you not to, not for anybody else, but for yourself. This is Hope to Recharge. I'm Atana. I'm here to guide you and support you through your challenging times, navigating through depression, anxiety, and other mental health struggles. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. That's BetterHelp.com, the leading online platform for therapy. Many people come to me for help. And one of my questions are, are you willing to go to therapy? Very often, it is very expensive. BetterHelp is affordable. You don't have to leave your house. You can get it from the comfort of your sofa, your bed, your office. It's one click away. There are thousands of licensed clinicians on this platform. Sometimes it's so overwhelming to go to therapy. Nowadays, most therapists are on Zoom. If you want to get 10% off your first month, use the link in the show notes, betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Use the link below and start your therapy from the comfort of your home. Millions of people from all over the world are using them. If you don't know where to start, go to betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. That's betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Start your wellness now. Thank you for joining me here on Hope to Recharge podcast. We are in this series of borderline DBT. I have the one and only amazing Meg Rowley with me here. Once again, thank you for joining me here. Thanks so much, Matana, for having me. I'm really excited to be back and talking about DBT. I was getting questions from different communities. Somebody reached out to me and they were telling me that their child went to a DBT program and they did it three months here and then they did this and they were hoping that they're going to see change and they're not seeing change. And suddenly I became the expert. Did they do DBT intensive? Did they do the whole thing? Did they do the group? There's a comprehensive. It's a whole thing. And I said, wait until our episode comes out because it's not just a one and done three months. Three months can be the introduction and it takes time to learn. And then they said, my child is learning disabled. I don't know if they will be able to go through a whole year because there's a lot of details with DBT. And she was trying to push back on why her child won't be able to survive the DBT year or two. What would you say to that? Yeah, I think it, one, it's really common when people are introduced to the whole program that either there's this reaction of, yep, let's do it, or, oh, I can't do that, or an X, Y, or Z. I'm learning disabled. I have attention deficit disorder. It's, it's not going to work for me. And I would push back on that and say it, it really reminds me a little bit of The DBT, we have assumptions when you enter a group and there's everyone's doing the best that you can and you may need to do better, try harder and be more motivated to change in order to get the life that you want. And you're balancing those things, right? I know that there are lots of kids, lots of adults that have learning disabilities who have gone through the material. And so I don't think that's something to rule out entering into a program. Of course, there's always going to be reasons why that's not going to work for me. And there is in DBT willingness to try, willingness to be open to it. So, okay. okay. I'm to do. push it a little bit more. Yep. A yep. little bit more. Give it a little bit more. Jesse, it's our mentor says that when we feel like we can't do it anymore, we only reach 40% of our capability. So when you feel like you're at your max, know that you have 60% more. <laughs> that's 60% of the bank. Yep. Yeah. 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 So the first episode, we touched upon what is borderline? What, are the, what is borderline personality disorder? How does one get diagnosed? We talked about the traits. Last episode, this episode number two, we spoke about the comprehensive DBT, the different modalities of DBT. And 
this time we want to touch upon, like break through a little bit, like the, the DBT actually step by step, what they look like. We, you said there were hundreds of different skills, skills, hundreds. right? Yeah. Hundreds of skills. But you also said that they're like families of skills. Like it's like a, right? It's like they go through different categories. Yeah. There's different modules that they're structured into. And that's how it's taught in a, a DBT group is, okay, we're doing mindfulness. Now we're doing this. Now we're doing... So it's taught in a group of skills. Mm -hmm. That being said, one of the things about DBT is as in one of the reasons why you might do a DBT skills group twice or a second round is so that you can really start to weave those skills and layer them, right? Because that's really what life is. Life is messy. Life is complicated. And so the goal is to get these skills and we teach it in a certain way. But the goal is to start to intertwine them in your life and maybe do mindfulness here and then interpersonal and maybe you need a distress tolerance scale, but really weave them into your life and use them mm. fluidly. Why do you think they named them skills? Because they are skills. They require you learning them, right? You might not have this. They require you getting the information. They require you practicing them, right? And then they require you generalizing them into your life. The only time that you're thinking or using skills is in your individual therapy session or your skills group. That's not going to do anything for you, right? You need to be practicing them in your life, but you first have to learn them, right? Get that data and then go out and start to use them. So they really are skills that are learned and then need to be practiced and generalized in different situations where your emotions are different and the intensity is different. Yeah. Mm. So maybe we should start off with telling people if they're thinking about DBT or they are ready and it's so overwhelming, give yourself grace because sometimes it takes a lot of time to learn a skill, to practice it, to become good at it and and go with a lot of self-love and self-acceptance of where you are now. And just because it might be difficult now doesn't mean that you won't be able to be fluent at it in a year or two. It's just like anything else, playing basketball cooking, any skill that we're acquiring that we want it badly, whether it's a passion or whether because it's because we don't like it, but we need it. I always say with computers, I am so not tech savvy, but sometimes I just need it. So I have to learn it in order to create whatever I want to create. So it's never something that I'm going to say, oh, yay, I get to learn something on the computer. Never going to be that, but I have to. Yeah. So. And that is so important to give yourself grace. And with each and every one of these skills, baked into it is patience with yourself, patience with the process, knowing that change takes time and that change is hard. While these skills, I truly know and believe, can help you create the life that you want, usually they require you giving up something that maybe has served you for a while and for oh. you just doing something different. Right. And that takes that can be difficult to do. So giving yourself a lot of grace, patience and a ton of encouragement when you practice these skills. I feel like the support group, like the group DBT is probably so powerful for just that, that they can hear from others. Yeah, I, I, this was hard for me. Oh, how do I do to clarify? How do I do this? And just to get feedback. A hundred percent. That, I think, is one of the most powerful pieces of the group dynamic and why the group is created the way it is. Because I can teach a skill, but it's so much more powerful, really, when a client comes in, somebody comes in, and they're like, I tried this, and this was my success, and this is how I applied that skill in this situation. Mm -hmm. Or I tried this, and I really had a hard time using this skill in this situation, and then to get mm -hmm. that or reinforcement, normalization from other folks in the group is really motivating and really powerful. And, and you really can't do that just with a clinician in the room. You need the group component there. And time. And time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I just want to say that hopefully we're going to have enough time at the end of the episode to touch upon how to support a family member that's going through either diagnosis or they're already diagnosed for a few years. How do you stay in a loving, healthy relationship 
for the both the sides, the one that is diagnosed, the one that is trying to heal, and the loved one that might not understand but loves them so deeply and they want to support them and motivate them and be there for them at the same time, take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll have time to touch upon that at the end of the episode. Just want to give that heads up that it's coming. And if not that, this episode, so next. So Meg, let's break down the skills. Okay, let's get into the skills. So when you enter into a skills group, typically the first set of skills that you're going to be introduced to are the mindfulness skills. And that's very intentional. The mindfulness skills in DBT are the building blocks of all the other skills. If you don't have a mindfulness practice or some of the mindfulness skills under your belt, it's really tough to do an effective deer man, which is like an interpersonal skill that we'll talk about a little bit later. Mindfulness at its core is intentional living with non-judgmental awareness in the present moment. So it's this idea of waking up from sort of automatic thoughts or ruminations or behaviors that you just do. Every time I get stressed out, I reach for this thing. I reach for a drink. Or every time I get stressed out, I engage in this behavior. And doing it non-judgmentally. You're not attaching to the past. You're not holding on to the present. You're staying really focused in the here and now and what's going on. And it's your anchor to reality, really. Mm. Because we can get so caught up in our emotions or our thoughts or our feelings or our interpretations. And mindfulness is what is happening right here without judgment or interpretation. I feel like I'm going to say this again. Wow. It's for everyone. It's for everyone. If we lived more mindful, our life would be so much more beautiful, alive, present, living alive. Even if it's hard, it's living alive. It's feeling it versus escaping it. And so few people really live with mindfulness until they learn it, until they have to learn it. And and then they enter into the beauty of life. Yeah. With all its messiness, which the beauty of life doesn't always mean, this is great. This is awesome. (laughs) The beauty of life of this is messy. And this is exactly mindfulness though gives you i always like to say it's there is a room with a lot of sharp objects or maybe glass on the floor or something would you want to walk into that room with the lights on or off (laughs) what a great analogy you'd want to do it with the lights on but it doesn't take away the fact that there's like sharp objects and glass Mm -hmm. on the floor but it gives you the opportunity to choose how you want to move through that room with all of the sharp objects and glass. And that's really what mindfulness is. It doesn't take yeah. away the situation, but it allows you to see it clearly without avoidance and without making the situation worse and distracting from the reality that you might be dealing with. Mm. Yes. Okay. So that's mindfulness. And one of the skills that you learn, and so there's these core mindfulness skills that you go through in that mindfulness module. But one of the core mindfulness skills is what's called wise mind in DBT. And really, all of the skills are in an effort to get you into your wise mind. And wise mind is your inner wisdom that all of us have within us that we might not feel like we have at times. Or maybe if we've had a lot of invalidation, we probably don't trust our wise mind. But It's essentially the synthesis between emotion mind, which is when you are ruled by your emotions are in charge, and reasonable mind, which is facts, logic, just the data on the ground. And the reality is we're emotional beings, right? Mm -hmm. But we need those facts and logic to make informed decisions. And wise mind is really this unique combination of holding space for your emotions and your emotional side. And also holding space for the logic, the facts, the data on the ground, and then moving forward with a combination of those two minds present. And that's wise mind. So how do I know to ask the wise mind? And how do I know that the wise mind is answering me versus what I'm used to, my neuroplasticity that I'm used to? Yeah. That's a great question. And typically wise mind is described as pretty conflict-free, right? It's usually calm. 
that you usually feel pretty grounded when you make the decision. I always like to say too, if you're not sure if you're in wise mind, if you think that you might be in emotion mind, because sometimes it can happen, wait, right? Wise mind is patient. Wise mm. mind, wait for a response. So sometimes a mindful gap is exactly what you need between the stimulus, right? And then the response. I'm not actually going to, I'm just going to wait and see if I still feel this way in 12 hours, in 24 hours. And then maybe I'll send that email, but I'm going to wait. And, and see then you it. check in with the wise mind? Exactly. You check in with your wise mind and say, is there still something that's aligned with my values now that maybe my emotions have shifted a little bit? Is this effective for me? And then you, use, you can use other skills to check in with that. But the goal is really to get into wise mind and for you to have a dialogue with your wise mind and be checking, like, am I in wise mind here when I make this decision? Is it only for decision making or is it also for how I feel? Checking the facts. I know that I heard a lot about check the facts. Are these facts true? And I do that a lot now because yeah. I'm like, wait, check the facts. And I'm like, no, it's my assumption. It's my feelings. It's based on history. Mm -hmm. So is it also to just regulate our emotions or is it in order to say, what's my wise mind telling me to do next step in it's, action? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's to check in with your emotions too, right? Your emotions are valid, but sometimes the intensity of them, right, might not fit the facts. And so checking the facts is a great way to get out of emotional mind and kind of move into wise mind. That's a great skill to help with that. And so it's really, it's trusting this inner wisdom that you have within yourself and knowing that it's there and using some of the skills to help you get into a place of making wise mind decisions. And wise mind decisions might be radical, but it doesn't mean that it's to soothe. It could be a decision that could be radical, but it's coming from, a, not from a reactivity, but it's coming from thinking it through and saying, okay, I'm owning this. It's not impulsive. Exactly. It's not impulsive. And it is there's overlap with your intuition. I think that the example sometimes that I use with wise mind is like if you're deciding where you want to go to college or what you want to do when you go to college, right? If you just look at the facts and you're just like, okay, what's going to be more financially viable for me? You could get to college and be absolutely miserable because we're not just robots. We have emotions and feelings. And so a wise mind decision may be, I want to take a gap year off and travel before I decide where I want to go. Now, a lot of people might be like that, have some judgments about that, but that can totally be a wise mind decision if you consider the facts and your emotions and then you move forward with it. Say, mm. this is what my wise mind is telling me is needed here. I love that because I never used to use my wise mind. I didn't know that it was called wise mind. But I call it like just breathing. I used to just say, okay, breathe through it. See how you feel tomorrow. Very often I used to be impulsive in my reaction. My Israeli hot-tempered personality what? was very impulsive. And I'm like, okay, breathe through it. You're feeling a lot of emotion. Breathe through it. See how you feel in a half an hour. Maybe you won't even need to react. And maybe you don't even have to share your opinion. And maybe tomorrow you'll even not even care about it. But what I find is that sometimes when I ruminate about something and maybe the intensity goes down, but there's still something there that I need to clarify. Often I'll write about it and journal about it and see what really comes up and what's underneath this. And then I can come to conclusion or do something about it based on really what do I want to gain out of this? Yeah. And journaling is a great way to connect with your wise mind. Meditating. Just mm -hmm. Breathing and following yeah. rest is a great way to just start to form that connection with wise mind and help you get into wise mind. It's a really core concept to DBT and one of the first skills that you learn in the mindfulness. Yeah. Module. And I can see how it can be difficult because we can be not trusting of what's the wise mind. Is it, it can be something that we can be a little bit like, is that wise mind? Is it my past behavior? Is it what I want? Am I fooling myself that it's a wise mind? 
So the more we practice mindfulness, I know with meditation, the more we practice meditation, the more we find clarity within. It just is. Yep. And the more that you pull on these skills, the more you practice them, the easier it is to get into wise mind and to feel, okay, this feels like a wise mind decision for me here. But it's a great one to decrease impulsivity. Yeah. Let me just pause. Is this Mm -hmm. what I do? Or can I just take a mindful gap and then come back to this and see if I still feel like this is aligned with my wise mind? And it's so empowering, so empowering that we have control. Especially if you have, which we talked a little bit about the biosocial theory, which really informs DBT and the skills. If you have had a a lot of invalidation in your life where people are telling you like, oh, you're wrong, you're crazy. What's wrong with you? You're so sensitive. Why are you so overreactive? It's really difficult to trust your wise mind. And yeah. like we said about giving yourself grace, this mm-hmm. takes time and patience with yourself in the process. Okay, great. Is there any other mindfulness skills that are like very important? So there's wise mind and then it, there's two sets of mindfulness skills. And Marshall Linehan, the creator, she actually went to study Zen Buddhism and what is happening here? What is happening here so that I can really distill what's happening in this process and bring it back to my clients? Because something powerful is happening in this process of mindfulness and and meditation. And she broke them into what's called the what skills, which is what is mindfulness when you break it down. And then the how skills, which is how do you practice them? And the what skills very quickly is observing, describing, and full participation. That is what she distills mindfulness into. And it's really doing that without judgment, being super present, like observing what's happening, and then describing it non-judgmentally to yourself and those around you, what you're witnessing in your world. And then the how skills is how do you bring mindfulness into your day-to-day life? And the three skills there are non-judgmentalness, so being really mindful of evaluative judgments, that person's bad, that person's good, right? Which judgments inflame our emotions, and they can get us further away from just the facts and yeah. the depth. Then there's one mindfulness, which is being really present, and then there's effectiveness, which is like doing or no last to get to you, your goals and live an effective life. And those are, you spend a couple of weeks usually in the skills group going into all of them and, and how to practice them in a nutshell is the mindfulness module. And you come back to the mindfulness module between every other module. And the reason for that is that it's essential to keep those skills present in all the yeah. other skills. And so it's a really important kind of foundation of all the skills. I wish I was taught this younger. Yes and no, in a way, because I wouldn't be so grateful for the work that I went through to get to where I am now. But sometimes I cringe thinking about how disconnected I was from mindfulness and how I was on autopilot, auto reactivity, not even observant. And sometimes I can close my eyes and go back to a a place where I reacted to something like I have shame about it now, but I keep on telling myself, you didn't know better. No one gave you the skills. You didn't know. And mindfulness is such a game changer for life in general. It really is. And I think that it's so important to have compassion for all stages of ourselves, right? And Those behaviors or those moments when maybe you, I know I have in the past, acted impulsively or Mm -hmm. reactively to a situation. We were doing the best that we could at the time, the information that we had. Maybe we can look back and say, I could have done that differently or better. But like at the moment, it was trying to serve us and having compassion for that part of Mm -hmm. ourselves. Yeah. Thank you for that, Meg. What are we doing to help ourselves improve and heal? What's important to us? 
How can we cultivate small changes in our brain and our day-to-day life with our own tools? Sometimes this process is very lonely and hard. Sometimes you need a therapist, a psychiatrist, and somebody like me, somebody that went through the same thing. And I love working with people that are ready to do the work because it is expensive. It's a lifelong investment into yourself, into your future. When you start working with me, you're investing into your long-term stability, into your long-term mental health. What are you willing to do to make the changes? You could say, I don't know what I want. I don't even believe things can change, but I'm no longer willing to stay in this position where I am now. Choose yourself. If you want to work one-on-one, link is in the show notes. Schedule a free 30-minute consultation and be ready to see a different you. So what's next? So you learn mindfulness. And then a lot of times when people come into DBT, their emotions are have been really high for a really long time. Or they may have been so high for so long that they feel numb. And they are engaging in behaviors to deal with the intensity or just to deal with life. And so a lot of times then after mindfulness, you learn what's called distress tolerance skills. Mm-hmm. And distress tolerance skills are skills that you use to help you get through a painful situation, right? One of the facts that we talk about a lot in DBT is that pain is unavoidable in life. Like you've experienced pain, right. I've experienced pain, and we all will again. And there are certain actions that we can take that can make those painful situations a lot worse and actually create a lot more suffering for ourselves. And distress tolerance skills are to help, at least in the short term, to help us not make the situation worse. Not escalate it. Not escalate it. Not look back and be like, okay, now, not only am I dealing with the problem that I started with, but now I have to deal with all of this other stuff that's come. And distress tolerance skills, especially the crisis survival ones, are your survival float. I just don't want to make this situation worse. And I am in a lot of pain right now. And I need to survive this. So if you get through the moment without making the situation worse, and you've used a distress tolerance scale, using it correctly. Sometimes people will be like, I don't feel better. That is okay. That's okay. Distress tolerance skills are actually just to keep from escalating the situation. Mm-hmm. And you feel mm-hmm. like your emotions are like a 10 out of 10. And many times when people come into DBT, they're dealing with what we call like behavioral dysregulation. So they're engaged in either like some sort of self-harm or some sort of substance abuse or disordered eating that's happening, right? There's some behavioral component to it. And so often the first set of skills that you'll learn in distress tolerance is basically how to tip your body into a place of a little bit more regulation. Mm. Physiologically move your body Mm. from how intense it feels, Mm. right? How activated it feels to a place where it feels a little bit more regulated, not quite as intensely. And the set of skills that you learn, is, it's called the tip skills. And the tip skills are all about really activating your parasympathetic nervous system. Mm-hmm. Which your sympathetic nervous system is the part that's fight or flight, right? right? And it's usually the part of your body that feels activated when you're feeling an intense emotion. It's what gets your heart pounding, all that stuff. And these skills are all skills that are designed to activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of your nervous system that kind of slows everything down, slows your heart rate when you're like sleeping. And we need that so that our bodies don't feel like they're on fire when you're having a really intense urge to do something. Wow. Yeah. So like another empower, like, again, like it's not that I'm out of control. I'm in control and I can control. And this is really why there's so much emphasis on learning about your emotions. You feel your emotions. We feel them in our bodies physically. Mm -hmm. And that can be really dysregulating for a lot of people to feel a ton of sensations. And it can also communicate to your brain, something's wrong here. I am in trouble, which becomes this whole cycle. And so the tip skills 
are activating your parasympathetic nervous system. And can, t- can you give us an example? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's an acronym. And the first piece, it T stands for temperature, okay? tipping the temperature of your body. And it's this really interesting scientific piece about ourselves that if you put cold water or ice on your face. Oh my God, that's why they say when you have a panic attack, put your fingers into ice and put a cold rag on your forehead? Yes. Cold. Or toes in ice. Yeah. Cold temperature on your face, it activates what's called the diver response in a human. And basically what your body thinks is going on, if you put like an ice pack or if you put or if you take a bowl of cold water and stick your head into it, is your body thinks that you've like dove underwater and it slows down your heart rate. And it's really interesting if you do this with a Fitbit or some sort of heart monitor and you can see your heart rate just start to go down. And so the way that you do this skill is you take an ice pack or a bowl of cold water, you put your face into it for about 15 to 30 seconds. If you have an ice pack, you want to have your head below your knees. So you've simulated that sensation and then you come back up and it's not going to change the situation. But what it does do is it can one like shock you and two, it activates that parasympathetic nervous system to start to slow everything down. And that's the first set in the tip scale that we teach to people. It's really powerful to have somebody be really feeling that intensely and to put an ice pack on their face and to feel a little bit more regulated Mm. afterwards. So do people walk around with ice packs? What if you're at work and there's no ice? Like, what do you do? I'm thinking like my first example that came to my mind is like, I always go into panic attacks when there's turbulence, high turbulence, like always. Mm -hmm. I learn to breathe through it it doesn't mean that it works but like i just have to like because i can go into a full-blown panic attack and i've traveled a lot and i'm almost always thinking i'm gonna die in a second and i'm like okay there's no ice around me so what do i do and i need to bring it down because i don't want to go on into a full-blown panic attack on an airplane yeah one if you have a dbt therapist they probably have one of those crunchable ice packs that you can put on your oh oh really okay They are like to-go ice packs that people have. So people do walk around with them. Oh, yeah. Like in our office, we have these sort of ice packs. Crunch, you put them on your face. They're really just... But you're right. That isn't always accessible. And going into the bathroom, splashing cold water, having a cold paper towel that you wet and put on your face and holding your breaths and having your head down below your knees. Is it going to be... As effective as an ice pack? Probably not, but it, is it going to replicate what the scale? Yeah. That being said, I have had some hens clients be like, I'm doing the tip scale. And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm drinking an iced coffee. Okay. Not it's like that is, I get the sort of desire and that is not quite the scale. So okay. okay. Trying to get as close as you can to simulate that sort of physical response. But it's supposed to be the face you're saying and you're face should be lower than your feet your feet lower than your knees but and then your the knees does this have to do with the wim hof method of ice baths is it the same source that's really interesting the win win hof method i don't think that they are connected in any way i know that he really advocates for that and the power of cold water but i don't know if they have any sort of connection because he talks about preparing your nervous system for crisis with ice bath. And then like, that's interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. And this is really like, how can I get through this crisis right now? And cold water can really help do that. Okay. Yeah. So what's the I? The I stands for, again, these are all physiological mm-hmm. skills. And so the I stands mm-hmm. for intense exercise, right? Intense aerobic exercise. A major characteristic of emotions is that they like organize our body for action. So if you're really angry, if you're really scared, doing some intense exercise can be a really effective way for that emotion to pass without making the situation worse. Doing high knees in your office. I've been known when I feel anxious to do some jumping jacks in my office. Yeah. It can be really effective. And mm-hmm. so that's the I is intense exercise. Okay. 
And okay, then, but it doesn't have to be for like an hour. It could be two minutes, five minutes. It can be whatever you have available to you. It can be okay. two, five minutes, but the idea is to get your heart rate up, to get your up. heart rate up so that when you're done, it starts to come down and you have the effect of tipping again your body into the parasympathetic nervous system. The final, the P in tip is for pace breathing. We've been talking about breath and the importance of it. It's so important. And when we are distressed, we tend to do a lot of things with our breath, right? We tend to breathe shallow. We tend to breathe quickly, which communi- which really stimulates that sympathetic fight or flight yeah. response. Yeah. And the P is to slow down your breathing. Really the sort of general takeaway from it is to make your exhale longer than your inhale. Just a little bit. Then seconds out, four seconds in. And that can be a really powerful way to help regulate your body and give you a moment to bring your emotions down and decide how you want to move next. So pace breathing. Yeah, that was the first thing they taught me when I had my first panic attack. Mm Mm-hmm. Breathe, breathe in whatever you can, then hold one second longer and breathe out one second longer. So is it two, three, four, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? But yeah. that was the first thing that they taught me, and I didn't know that it had a connection to this. Yeah, and I think sometimes people will get caught up in how long do I have to breathe in, how long do I have to breathe out? This is The general principle is breathe out a little bit longer because... Right. If we're looking at that scientific piece, when you breathe in, that gets your heart rate going faster. If you breathe out, that gets your heart rate going a little bit slower and activates Mm -hmm. the parasympathetic nervous system. And if that's all you can take, if that's all you can retain, especially when you're in the crisis, awesome. Do that. Breathe out a little bit longer. Slow your breath down. Breathing from your belly too. And these a lot of these skills too, like we were talking about, you can't always reach for an ice pack. You can always come back to your breath, right? right. You always right. have your breath. It's always accessible to you. So there's a couple of different options to navigate a situation. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And if you are, that's my hair's on fire and I am about to act on something that I don't want to, how can I get through this moment? Those are the distress tolerance skills. But a lot of time and where most people I think spend their time is in the skill set around emotion regulation. Mm-hmm. And emotion regulation is the ability to control or influence which emotions you have when you have them, how you experience them and express them, and how to respond when your emotions are really high in a way that's aligned with your values and your goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think with emotion regulation, a lot of times people be like, are you telling me to get rid of my emotions? Are you telling me like that there are certain emotions that I shouldn't feel or that it's not the goal of emotion regulation? The goal is to reduce emotional suffering and give you more choices in how you want to respond to mm-hmm. emotions and what you want to do with them. Yeah, which is very similar to mindfulness. Be present. Yep. Okay. Which is- why we learn those mindfulness skills because they're really important in informing all the other skills. And I'd say that in emotion regulation, there are a lot of what we would call like cognitive behavioral skills. And one of the major ones that you touched upon is checking the facts. The facts is one of the core emotion regulation skills because we often react to our thoughts and our interpretations of an event rather than the actual event itself. Okay. So this is the idea of checking the facts on that. Right. Make sure that you're not actually responding to your interpretations and judgments about something that might not be right. Internal honesty is so important here. We can feel like, yeah, it's a fact. It's a fact. I'm like, is it really a fact? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's such a good point, too. Is that like in order to do checking the facts, it requires you getting really like honest with yourself and being like, is this actually a fact? Do I know this? Or is this like a feeling that I have about this situation that it might not be, I may not have enough information to really make that determination about the situation. 
I think checking the facts is great for text messages. <laughs> so often people, oh, nobody, they didn't text me back. They want to break mm. up or they're no, maybe, but so, but maybe not. And if you move forward on your feeling about mm. the situation, you can sometimes break the situation a whole lot worse than if you really mm. slow down and check the facts on it and yeah. your interpretations and other possible reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and what if the facts are true? Like we check the facts are true and they're really painful. Yeah, that's such a great question because sometimes that is the reality that the facts are true, right? right. The feelings do fit the facts. Yeah. And if you check the facts and your facts are accurate and your feelings fit the facts, you move into problem solving. Mm -hmm. How am I going to deal with this? What are my options here and how I want to approach this? Brainstorming a lot of it. And there's a skill for that too. Okay. Really, you got to check the facts first before mm -hmm. you decide, do I go into problem solving or do I go into what's called opposite action, right? Maybe my fact, my feelings don't fit the facts so much and I might want to practice acting opposite to this emotional, this emotion that I'm feeling. Yeah. You know why this is so important? Because if we don't check the facts and we're reacting based on emotion, not facts, and then we, you go into problem solving and we're solving something, we're trying to solve a problem that didn't create it. Then that moment we can create a problem by trying to solve something that didn't happen. And that's the next level of, we're just created something that wasn't there because we went to solving something that didn't happen. And it happens so often. I can think of myself that so many times I'm like, I reacted to something and I already went into the next step of, okay, conclusions, this is what I'm going to do. And they're like, wait, what? Yeah. And then it becomes a whole crisis. And then it becomes a crisis. And then <laughs> distress tolerance skills. Yeah. That's so such a great point on why we start with checking facts. Yeah. You don't want to start problem solving a problem that might not actually be. Up. And create a whole set that wasn't there. So what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. So that's like the hub of like emotion regulation. I think of a lot is check the facts. Do my emotions and the intensity fit the facts? And is this emotion something that I want to keep feeling? Right. If so, okay, yes, that's true. Maybe I need to go into problem solving. It's not serving me or my feelings and intensity don't fit the facts. Maybe I want to do opposite action to this emotion, which is its own set of skills, which I think is a really powerful skill that a lot of times people will be like, are you telling me to just like say how I'm feeling? No. This is another option that you have, another choice that you have. Sometimes think about if you've been feeling depressed and you're in bed and you're like, this is not serving me anymore. This isn't working mm. for me anymore. That might be an option. And when I really check it, things are, I'm, I'm struggling with depression, but laying in bed is not helping me feel like right. better. That might be right. the time when you reach for opposite action to depression. You're going to get dressed. You're going to do all those things that your emotion is telling you not to, not for anybody else, but for yourself. Because it might reboost a little bit. And just instead of going deeper into the depression, it might just like plateau for a little bit or just not to escalate, like you said before, just to have it under control and not get it out of control. Yeah. And with the skill of opposite action, there's this idea of like, our, our emotions love themselves, right? If we're mm. depressed, our mm -hmm. urge is get into bed, pull the blanket over our head. Yeah. That's our urge. But right. that does not help move you out of depression. Sometimes what you need in that moment is to act opposite. Okay. And so that's that's emotion regulation skill set there. Okay. Wow. That's a lot, Meg. There's a <laughs> and that's why they ask for a year commitment to a DBT program and yeah. six month commitment to skills group. Because there's a lot of information and kind of the first time you're in skills group, it can feel like a lot. It's just like getting the data can be a lot. Mm -hmm. Is everyone in DBT walking around with a cheat sheet for the first three, six months? I like, think okay, let me take it out. Yes. I know I did when I was like training as a clinician. I was like, what? there's a... and I really encourage people to write out like on their cell phone, take a screenshot and have the skills that are your go-to skills. Because there are a lot. And it can be tough to remember them. Cheat sheets, mm. big fan of cheat sheets. Yeah. 
Are there any other skills? That's basically the foundation. That's mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotion regulation, and then we have interpersonal effectiveness. Okay. And interpersonal effectiveness is all about teaching people to apply certain interpersonal problem-solving skills and assertiveness skills to help them navigate their environment and to increase the likelihood that you get your needs met in an effective way and in a way that you can feel proud of, right? Sometimes Mm -hmm. we get our needs met in a way that's not super effective, If I yell at my husband and say, you got to make the bed, he'll probably make the bed, but I might not feel super great about how I did that. And so emotion regulation is all about like how to ask and get your needs met effectively. Communicate effectively. How to communicate effectively. A lot of them are around assertiveness. One of the major skills in the interpersonal effectiveness is basically how to get a request met how to ask for something effectively from Mm -hmm. be it you're asking for praise or you're asking somebody to clean up something or you're asking somebody to come home at a certain time and that's called a dear man and the dear man is another acronym and they do all these acronyms because it's to help people just remember (laughs) because and the dear is what do you say? What do you say? And the man is how qualities you want to bring into the dear man. So I'll go through them pretty quickly. The D stands for describe. Describe your situation non-judgmentally. Orient the person to what you're about to talk to them about. And it doesn't have to go on and on forever. You told me you're going to be home by dinner, but you didn't get here until 11. You're basically just orienting the person to this is what I want to talk about, but you're not doing it with judgment. The next mm-hmm. is the E in the dear man, which is to express your feelings and your opinions about the situation and not assuming that the other person knows how you're feeling just because you said you didn't come home until 11, right? Saying when you come home so late, I really start to worry about you. I worry about you. I was worried. But again, those I statements in your express. And then the A, and I think that this can sometimes be the toughest part for people, is to assert, right? Assert what you're asking for by the other person. Not to assume that they know just because you said, I was worried about you, that they're going to know. I would really like it if you would call me when you're going to be late. And just a really clear, direct ask. And then the R is a reinforce reinforcing the person ahead of time by explaining why this is beneficial for you and them if they did this thing. And a reinforce could be, a lot of times people say, do I have to give somebody something? No, a reinforce would be, it would mean so much to me. I wouldn't be up wringing my hands if you called me and let me know you're going to be home. So it's all at the same time, not before it happens again to reinforce how important it is. The reinforcement is at the same conversation. Yeah, you're basically reinforcing the person ahead of time for honoring your ask. Okay. And that's how you do the dear man. Mm -hmm. And the man part sounds for what you want to bring, the qualities you want to bring into that ask, that conversation. You want to be mindful. And mindfulness here really looks like staying focused on what you're asking for not getting distracted by not accusing not right not, yeah not being vulnerable about you versus assumptions jumping to conclusions making a whole story bringing in history you got it you got it and you can also expect sometimes when you ask people for something they might push back a little bit or they might say mm-hmm. well, you, didn't. you didn't text me when you came home late When being mindful, you could say, yep, but I really want to just stay focused on what we're talking about now. So you're coming back to that, being mindful and a broken record. Could you please call me when you're going to be late? Can I just ask you about that? When you're bringing up a topic that's important to you and the other person says, but you do the same or whatever, like they give you a spotlight on the mirror Mm -hmm. and they don't care about it. They don't complain. They don't, it doesn't bother them. But they're like, wait, is this a double standard? And then the other person say, but we're not talking about me now. Mm-hmm. Like we're talking. 
why is that okay? Like, how is that okay? How is that conducive? If we're really being mindful here, oh, you're right, you know what? Maybe be both versus saying, I'm talking about me now. Yeah, that's a great question. And mindfulness and staying a broken record does not mean that you ignore the valid parts that the other person is saying, right? So if the person says like, you could say, yes, and I want to talk about that at some point, or yes, I will be mindful of that. But really the idea here is that you're not getting distracted, right? And starting to talk about something completely outside of your ass. Because okay. this is really about you getting your needs met, doing it effectively. And so often, right, it can so quickly crumble into, you did this to that, and you're not really even talking about any sort of solutions moving forward. You've gotten so far from the topic. And the idea of mindfulness here is, sure, you want to validate the other person, you want to hear the other person, but you also want to stay really focused on like your ask and getting your needs met here and having the other person be fair to you. Maybe that mm. happened, but right now we're talking about what happened last night and that you didn't come home to 11 o'clock and you didn't call me. You call me when that happens again. And then we can talk about my stuff. But right now, can we talk yeah. about that? I find that I have such a hard time not mirroring the other person's action when they're asking for something. Like I find it like hypocritical. And my internal guide is, wait one second, you're asking? Well, where are you? You do the same. Yeah. And I have a very hard time when they say, we're not talking about that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's super valid. But I also think that like when that happens, like when if you're mirroring somebody's intensity, that's how situations escalate. escalate right. And, how we and no one gets what they want. <laughs> and you just get into a fight. That's why this mindfulness is so tough because it can be. It's so easy to say, oh, yeah, that happened, but then you did that time. And then mm -hmm. what are we even, we're fighting now. We're not talking. Yeah, but sometimes it's a conversation and it's, I appreciate when people hold up the mirror to me. When they have an ask, I really appreciate, if I have an ask, yeah. that, no, sorry, if I have an ask and it's not reasonable, I really appreciate when somebody holds a mirror up and say, hey, Matana, you're the same. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. It helps me be less judgmental and more accepting and more tolerant. Yeah. It just, it's grounding for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that being able to hear that information and take it in and accept it is a part of being in a relationship. And I think that with the dear man, it's, I can do that and I can see that there's some stuff that I need to work on. and. This is still important to me, too. And maybe another part of man, the end, actually, yeah. then to the end, is to negotiate, which is being willing oh. to give to get, right? Okay. So maybe they say, why would I call you? You never mm. call when you're late. Okay, you know what? That's valid. Okay. When I think about the man, you want to stay focused on your ass, but yeah. you're not being rigid in your dear man. You're staying focused on your needs and your wants. But you're also being open to negotiating with this person on how you can somehow get some of your needs met here, which that is the negotiation, which I think would be really reasonable. I will be mindful to text you when I'm late. If you can be mindful to text me as well. Yeah. This whole dear man, I don't know if I think I asked you if you read Nonviolent Communication. It's mm -hmm. a small little book that's brilliant and it really speaks about that. Be vulnerable. Be sure what you're asking. Be very clear on the ask. No accusing. And it's about you. And also the whole relationship of how to ask, what to ask, when to ask. It's really a great book that breaks down, I think, very similar to Dear Man. Yeah. No, I haven't read that. And I've had people talk to me about it. I'm like, wow, that sounds really similar. Like the Dear Man. Very similar. Mm -hmm. And it's such an easy... And if we used it really in communication, I think we would avoid so many painful outcomes of violent communications and not honest communications. And are we talking about it to fight? Or is it a debate or is it a conversation? Yeah. Are we talking about it to win and be like, oh, right. or are we talking right. about it to move forward in a meaningful way? Thank you. Thank you for that. Where does 
I know radical acceptance is huge in the DBT world. Yeah. Where does that fall under? Yeah, radical acceptance falls under a distress tolerance scale. And the distress tolerance skills that I had spoke to you about, the tip skills, those are those crisis survival skills. How do I get through this situation without making it worse? There's another set of skills in the distress tolerance module that how do I live in a life that maybe has some parts of it that like I think are on just that I don't like. How do I accept parts of life that I don't like or that seem unacceptable to me? And that's radical acceptance. And it's really reality acceptance skills. And all of the skills in there are helping you to radically accept basically what you do have control over, which is really not a ton when you think about it. Right. right. And right. to stop, not to stop trying to change things, but to let go of trying to change things that you have absolutely no control over. And when you said that there's like a skill of check the facts and react out of the wise mind, that like the whole idea of radical acceptance is only once you accept it and come to full terms that these are the facts, this is really what's happening. If there is a solution, it's only after that. The wise mind solution come and the proper solution or ways to move forward can only come after radical acceptance. Absolutely. And I think that sometimes the example that I give to introduce radical acceptance is it's very similar in a lot of ways to that. The first step in a 12-step program of accepting that there is a problem, accepting that I have a problem with alcohol or I have a problem with this substance, until you have that honest conversation of acceptance right, and come to that place, you might keep trying to do it this way or keep trying to do it that way, or right? And it continues to build the problem. And so before you can meaningfully change the problem, you have to radically accept the facts on the ground. And then you can right. move forward. And when I learned about radical acceptance many years ago, it really helped me with how I respond and what is in my control. And is there anything in my control versus denial, victim, not fair, it's resistance to whatever. If there is any way to make it better, it won't come if we don't accept the facts mm -hmm. and sit with it and might have to go through grief, anger, resentment, frustration, and a lot of that. And then maybe we can get into what are my options Yeah, yeah. if I have any. Yeah. And usually with radical acceptance, those emotions that you just named they are what sometimes makes it really hard to radically accept and to keep fighting reality is I don't want to feel sad about this. I don't want to accept this. That is definitely a piece that comes in practicing radical acceptance is being mindful and honoring those emotions that come when we accept something. I mean, we yeah. want to. It tells it. It's one of the hardest things to do radical acceptance because you have to actually sit afterwards in the emotions that come up, which are so often the reason why people don't go through the healing process because no one wants to feel sad and no one wants to hear, feel resentment or angry or grief because they're brutal feelings and they're so hard yeah. to yeah. walk through. Yeah. But yeah. when we don't go into radical acceptance, they're bottled up within us. It's not like they're not there. They're there and it's percolating and it's just there. And it just, once it's, it's released, there's this, okay, fine. It's a surrender to whatever it is. And now what? Okay. Let's look at what is possible, see if there is. Yeah, and it allows you to move forward because sometimes rejecting the reality of the situation keeps us stuck in the same stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's the skill of getting on, helping you get unstuck, even if there is pain that comes with that. Yeah, yeah. So Meg, did we cover the tree, the foundations of skills? Yeah, we covered some really important skills and we touched on every single one of the different modules that you would go through. And of course, in a skills group, you're going to be getting more examples. You're going to be use, doing homework on this. You're going to be really sitting with these skills, bringing in, troubleshooting it with your skills trainer and other people in the group. And so that's why skills groups takes the time that it does, because there's a lot of information that you're getting in that group. 
Is there a DBT app that people can use as they're learning? Like, I'm thinking, like, it would be so helpful if I could just do, okay, scan through. Is this, do I need to use this skill, that skill, this module? I did this. Because sometimes we're so overwhelmed with our emotions, it's hard for us to write it down. And to, so it just captures it with click. And so many people with ADD, ADHD, it's hard for them. Yeah. Totally. And there are a lot of different apps out there that kind of have the DBT skills. An app that I use a lot with my clients is an app called Psych Survey. And Psych Survey, it has the diary card part. And it also has a prompt of, did you use any skills? And then it lists all of the skills. So you can say, yep, this is what happened today. And I did use Wise Mind. I did access my Wise Mind and move forward from that place. And so mm. there's a lot of different apps. The one that I really like and prefer is called Psych Survey. I have clients sure. mode usually. Okay, that's good to know. So we didn't have time to touch upon family members. And Meg, will you come again? Sure. Yeah, I would love <laughs> No, I feel like we could talk for literally hours. There's a lot. Yeah, this is so important. Yeah. And I'm very grateful for your time and your talent, your wisdom, I want to close off with what you said to me before we went on air, before we press record, and we're go- that will lead us for the next recording. And you mentioned, I said, I want to make sure that these series are not going to be hurtful to the borderline community. And I said, I want to be very mindful of that. And what was your answer? My answer was, and this is something that I think about a lot with my clients that the people I work with is to not fragilize a person, right? I think when you think about what perpetuates to invalidation, a lot of that is fragilizing somebody. They they can't hear this information or if they hear this information, that's just going to, you know, they're not going to be able to handle that. And DBT and as a DBT therapist, I believe in my client's ability to be okay with the reality of what's going on and to be able to hear hard truths, even if that might be activating at points. And I don't think that holding somebody as fragile ever really helps them come into their wise mind or feel empowered. And all pieces about family members, about how to take care of family members, and also how to support somebody who might be experiencing BPD symptoms. Those are things that I would share with any client, really, any client, any family member, and feel really, and believe that it will do more good than harm, and that people can really take that information in. I think it's interesting that you're saying the the word fragile because, and I'm going to wrap up with this, because when anybody asks about any books out there for the borderline community or living with loved ones, which is going to be our next episode with anybody that lives with a loved one or friend or family member with borderline, they send them to the book walking, walking on eggshells or don't walk on eggshells. What, what is, what is that book called? Yeah. There's, I believe it's, there's a book like stop walking on eggshells or something. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the epitome of fragile. And what happens a lot in these transactions is the biosocial theory is all about the back and forth between the person and the environment and a fragilizing kind of being like, oh, I can't say this or I've got to not let tell them that or that leads to somebody feeling more invalidated. And so it becomes this kind of transaction where maybe the person feels really scared to be direct and they have been reinforced for fragilizing somebody. And a part of DBT is being mindful of that and stopping that. In And there's techniques and tools to help do that effectively. Right. But fragilizing somebody doesn't help them move into their wise mind or get you know, worth living. Right. And I guess what we're going to talk about next episode is how to do it with compassion, with care, and to give patience for the person that's learning DBT skills because it takes time and how to have that perfect balance or try to have a balance. What I gained out of this episode was DBT is all about empowerment and taking back control when we feel out of control. Literally, this is all about making the right choices. I have choices. I can do this. I have the ability. And just acquiring these literally empowerment. Yeah. 
that I have multiple ways to respond in a situation. I have choices. I have options. Yeah. Thank you, Meg. Thank you for your work. Thank you for being so lovely. And I have already a list of questions from family members, and we're going to conquer it next time. Amazing. I can't wait. Bye till next time. Bye. Thank you for listening till the end. We highly appreciate all of our listeners. And Mental Health Together is better. You being here means a tremendous amount to us. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like some extra boost of information and inspiration that is not on the podcast, you can go to our website, hopetorecharge.com. There's some premium content that for the cost of a cup of coffee, you can download some amazing information that will help you, a tool that will guide you through life. So so don't skip a beat. Don't hesitate. Go to hopetorecharge.com and see what other offerings we have there for your mental health well-being. Thank you for joining us. And remember, if you enjoyed this and you want to say thank you, the best way of gratitude will be by you leaving a review or a comment or sharing this with a loved one. There is no greater form of gratitude for us. Thank you. Bye till next time. Looking to reduce your anxiety and stress, relax your muscles, or get a better night's sleep? Check out Maxifies.com, 100% legal hemp, where you can find doctor-formulated, lab-certified, high-quality CBD oils, tinctures, and other items, cultivated, grown, harvested, and packaged in the United States, and available in different sizes and strength formulas. Check out Maxifies.com, that's M-A-X-I-F-Y-Z.com, and use coupon code HOPE to get 10% off your order plus free shipping. That's Maxifies.com.